Well, good morning. It's nice to be here. Um, and so, as we said, we're going to have very few slides. We're actually going to have only two slides. And the rest of the time is for me to be a resource for you to ask any questions you have about anything. Uh, and we'll go through medicines. Somebody asked me about stem cells out there in the waiting room or the outside. Uh, we can discuss that as well. So we'll get started with the first slide. Actually, I'm going to. So this graph. If you understand this graph, then you understand how Parkinson's works, how the Parkinson's medicines work or don't work, or usually why they're not working, and why your doctor is picking specific medicines. So it's not that we go to the cupboard and we say, hey, I'm going to go pick the most expensive medicine, the one that the insurance company is going to say for sure, no, that needs a prior auth. The reason that we're picking these medicines is this is what's happening in Parkinson's. Remember. Parkinson's disease, for some reason, cells deep in the brain start to die off, and those cells produce dopamine. And as you lose about 60% of those cells that produce dopamine, that's when you first visit the neurologist. But you've had Parkinson's, by the time you see the neurologist, you've had about 60% cell loss. That means you've already had PD about 10, 15 years, what we call the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So things like constipation, or anosmia, you lose your sense of smell. You can have restless legs, you can have depression, or even you can have something called RBD, or REM sleep behavior disorder. So usually when you go to sleep, and you go to dream sleep, REM sleep, which is the dream sleep, usually you're paralyzed so that you don't act out your dreams. But in Parkinson's disease, that paralysis doesn't take place, so you're free to talk, yell, scream, kick, and punch, and you're basically acting out your dreams, and that's present many decades before you ever see the neurologist and before you're ever diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. But by the time you get the motor symptoms, about 60% cell loss, that's when you come and see the doctor and we're sort of right over here. Now you have a tremor. So the motor symptoms of PD are things like tremor, a resting tremor, so you're watching TV, you're gonna watch the game today. So if Texas is winning, so whether Texas is winning or losing, that resting tremor is gonna start going because anytime you have excitement or stress, that brings out the tremor. You can have rigidity or, uh, rigidity or stiffness and bradykinesia or slowness of movement and trouble with gait and balance. So those are the things that the neurologist uses in the clinic to make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. Many times patients say they'll come to our clinic for a second opinion and they say, oh, the doctor looked at me for two minutes, saw me walk and said you had PD. And so... That's literally what can happen. We still make the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease in the clinic as a clinical diagnosis. The reason that your neurologist orders a CAT scan or an MRI or lab work is to rule out other things that can mimic Parkinson's disease. So did you have a stroke in the basal ganglia? Is there a tumor? Is there something else that can mimic Parkinson's disease? But otherwise, it's still a clinical diagnosis that's made in the office. So when you develop those motor symptoms, then it's time to replace dopamine. And so we come here, and we, right now you're still making, oops, let's see, point it this way. Uh, when you're still making your own dopamine, enough of your own dopamine, when they start you on Cinemet, on Carbidopa, Levodopa, you start it at one tablet three times a day, and usually you're just buffering so that if you miss the noon dose, it's not such a big deal, nothing happens because you're still making enough of your own dopamine. But as the disease progresses and you continue to lose dopamine-producing cells, then we have to replace more of that dopamine with the medication. And so that's where the problem comes. Is that therapeutic window gets smaller and smaller. It's hard to, for us to stay in that window taking oral medications because then we either peak and trough. We peak above so you get on time with dyskinesia, the extra wiggly movement, and then we trough, we fall below, and then that's what your off periods are. Once you're off, the longer you wait to take that next dose of medicine, the longer it takes to kick in. So the reason that your doctor is using more expensive medicines than new medicines is that we want to use medicines that work like the normal brain. 
The normal brain gives you a continuous dopamine tone over the 24-hour period. It doesn't pulse you with dopamine every three to four hours like we do with cinnamon. So that's why we pick Mirapex ER versus the three times a day Mirapex. We're always trying to pick a once a day medicine if possible. That's why we'll use Ritari, a four to six hour version of Cinemet if, if we can. So that we're always using longer acting forms of the medicine so that we stay in that therapeutic window as, long, as much as possible during the day and that you have less off periods during the day. So what questions do you have about this, this graph? Mm -hmm. um, We're going to bring you the microphone. Oh, and make sure not to hold the microphone at the bottom. Hold it in the middle. Okay. Um, let's see now if I can remember what I was going to ask. The right regular. carry uh -huh. compared to regular cinemat. So how, the regular cinnamon, how fast does it move? And, and when does it leave compared to the long acting? So cinnamon, so carbidopa levodopa, that levodopa turns into dopamine in the brain, exactly the same chemical that's needed that you're missing. And the carbidopa is there to make you less nauseous, make sure more of the levodopa gets into the brain. Because otherwise, what, what percentage of that levodopa that you take as your yellow cinnamon do you think gets into the brain? Does anybody know? Anybody want to take a guess? You mean with that carbidopa? Yeah, with your yellow pill. Zero? It's a, it's one. No, it's not zero because then we take and nothing would happen. But it's it's only one percent. It's very very little, and so your cinemat it lasts ninety to three ninety minutes to three hours. If you still are on this other side of the graph where you're you still have forty percent of your cells making dopamine, you don't notice it too much if if you're twenty minutes late or an hour late with the medicine. But if you're on this side of the graph where that window's very narrow and that most of your dopamine is coming from the pill, once the pill's metabolized, boom, you're off. Once you're off, then it takes longer for that next pill to kick in. Because remember, Parkinson's disease makes all of the muscles of the body move slower, including the muscles of the gut. Because most of the medicines are oral, we're swallowing them, they go into the gut, you know, and they end up in the tummy. So they end up in the tummy, but they actually don't get absorbed until they get into the small intestine. But if you have a slow gut, or what we call gastroparesis, then these pills take longer. They're swimming in the tummy longer. And instead of taking 20 minutes to get into the small intestine, it can take up to an hour or even longer. Then the other thing that happens is that you're constipated. So remember, you know, the, you're, if you're constipated, if you have gastroparesis or a slowed gut, the slower the food moves through the gut, the more fluid gets sucked out of the stool. The stool gets hard, you get constipated. If you're constipated, that gastrocolic reflex doesn't work. So usually what happens, you eat a meal, the tummy tells the colon, hey, I just ate a big meal, we're coming through, you need to evacuate the stool. If you're constipated, that gastrocolic reflex doesn't work, so the food sits in the tummy longer, everything's slowed down. So if you're taking your medicines as oral medications, then we're at the mercy of the gut, and that's why patients have a delayed on, or a failure, a dose failure, didn't kick it at all, we have to take another dose. And so well, that's one important reason to make sure that the constipation is under control. The less constipation you have, the more efficiently those medicines are working. One of the reasons that we choose medicines that bypass bypass the gut. So many times we'll use Nupro or Reticotine, which is a patch that goes through the skin. Now there's Embresia, an inhaled version of levodopa that we can use as a rescue medicine so that we can take it and it kicks in quickly, but just doesn't last as long. And we have Duopa, which is a gel form of levodopa that uses a pump to go directly into the small intestine and then keep you on as much as possible so that as that therapeutic window gets smaller and smaller, if I'm pumping in levodopa, just like I use a diabetic pump for insulin, I don't peak and trough as, as much, and I don't peak above the line or trough below the line. I can keep, keep your levodopa where it needs to be and keep you on most of the day. So Ritari is a formulation of levodopa. That's a capsule that has immediate release cinnamon in it and, and cinnamon CR. 
We used to use a lot of Cinemet CR because it's the only thing that we had, but many patients would say, oh, I hate Cinemet CR. CR stands for crummy release, because they would just sit in the stomach and not get to where it needs to be. So with the capsules, uh, it has a, you know, makes it last four to six hours. So many times, if you're taking Cinemet every two, two and a half hours, six, seven times a day, then we'll switch you over to Ritari and try to cut that in half. So if you're on six times a day, maybe we can go to three or four times a day. The problem with Ritari, it's not a one-to-one -one conversion. So it's a little bit difficult if you're advanced PD to switch over. So it's something that you have to stick with and discuss with your neurologist, because uh, usually we have to pick a dose and then we have to titrate either up or down from there. And that one pill of Cinemet equals three capsules of Ritari. Uh, so everybody says, oh, I thought you know, I'm going to be taking less pills. It's not less pills. It's taking it less times during the day. So many times patients go home, they're like, oh, I only took one capsule four times a day, and it didn't work uh, because it's not the same conversion. So many times we'll pick a dose. If you get dyskinetic or wiggly and you're on three capsules three times a day, we'll just lower it to two uh, three times a day. If, you, if we pick a dose and it's not enough, it's not kicking in, then we'll increase it from there. So the conversion of somebody who has advanced PD with Ritari requires some titration, whereas if you start de novo early on from Ritari, then it's super easy. We just start you on a low dose and then gradually titrate up. But Cinemet, or Levodopa, is still the gold standard for the treatment of Parkinson's disease because it turns into dopamine in the brain exactly the same chemical that you're missing. The problem is that we don't have a once-a-day levodopa, a once-a-day pill. And so that's what causes all of the problems in the treatment of Parkinson's disease, the wearing off, uh, the dyskinesia. Although today, you know, we look at the room, nobody has dyskinesia today. So that's because of the newer agents, the once-a-day dopamine agonist, longer-acting forms of Ritari, and things like DBS or deep brain stimulation. So we have a question from uh -huh. online, and it's related to the off times. How mm -hmm. can we try to avoid the off times? What should people do? So the off times are happening because now you don't have enough of your own dopamine. The dopamine is all coming from your medication, and we've troughed. We've gone below that therapeutic window, and we have to climb back up. So we use once a day med. So many patients on triple therapy. You're just not on Cinemet, you're on a dopamine agonist, whether that's Mirapex, Requip, or Nupro, and you may be on an MAOB inhibitor like Rosagiline or Azlect or Zodago or Selegiline. So that we use different kinds of medicines to try, try, to try to keep your on period as long as possible, keep you in that therapeutic window as long as possible. And we wanna switch, so that's the reason why your doctor will say, oh, you're taking Mirapex three times a day, let's try Mirapex ER, even though your insurance company says, well, that's a prior auth, we don't want to pay for it. Or we say, we'll add in Rosagiline or Zodago, an MAOB inhibitor that inhibits the metabolism of dopamine, both the one that you're still making and the one that you're taking as levodopa, to make it last longer. And then switch you to Ritari or switch you to Duopa, uh, which is the gel form of levodopa. Once you switch over to duopa, many times we can get rid of all of your other medicines. We can keep you on monotherapy with duopa because we don't need the extenders anymore because you're getting that continuous release dopamine tone. So the off periods are coming because your medicine's wearing off. And so and think of your levodopa like gas in the car. So if you drive your car at 80 miles an hour, it's gonna use it more gas than if you drive at 50 miles an hour. So that's why patients say, you know, some days my medicine lasts three to four hours and some days it only lasts two to three hours. That's because PD is the poster child for the mind-body connection. Everything that you're thinking, feeling, gets reflected in the Parkinson's disease. The more stress you have, whether that's physical stress, you're doing, you're doing uh, physical therapy, you're going out shopping, or emotional stress, you're watching the OU Texas game, that's going to burn through your levodopa faster. So depending on what you're doing that day, what you ate, what, how well you slept, all of that impacts how long your medicine lasts. And so our goal is to try not to have that medicine wear off so that you don't have the off periods. 
And we do that by using longer acting forms of the medicine or keeping your shortening the interval between your doses of medicine. So remember, we're dosing you, your body, not the clock. So let's say you're on 8, 12, 4, and 8, but you did physical therapy and you wore off at 11. If you wait until 12 to take the next dose of medicine, now you've been off an hour. Now it's going to take even longer for that dose to kick in. So when you first notice your medicine wearing off, that's when you want to take that next dose of levodopa, whether it's the tingling in the feet or the tremor came back, or you can have non-motor symptoms of PD. That can be anxiety, depression. Some people have a panic attack before the tremor comes. That's when you want to dose the next dose so that you don't wear off. But it's the reason why every time you go to the neurologist, we are picking the most expensive drugs, the ones that require the prior auth, is because we want to keep you on as much as we can during the day. Let's, uh, I want to let the audience know how we're going to do this. We okay. have three microphones in the room. So if you want to ask a question, raise your hand, and we're going to alternate, but just raise your hand, and we will come to you. And um, so we'll go ahead and start here with Pam. We're also taking questions online, too. How long does uh, carbidopa levodopa cinnamon CR last? So CR should last more than three hours, but as we said before, because it sits in the tummy, many patients say it's called crummy release. So today, we don't use that much CR. We use Ritari. It works a lot longer. Ritari lasts four to six hours. So me used to do a lot, a lot of cinnamon CR at night to try to bridge that gap overnight when you weren't taking medication. Today, we'll use Ritari uh, in that, because it doesn't let, cinnamon CR is not going to last all night for you. Uh, so we use Ritari, which lasts four to six hours. And the other thing is that Merck has stopped production of Cinemet CR, so it'll be more difficult to get Cinemet CR as that um, production you know, if, you know, uh, exhausts itself. Go ahead, Leslie. Why, when I'm on an off period, why anxiety? So, so, anxiety. Yep. so you, the question, you repeat that? Oh. yeah, uh, so the question is like, why, when I'm off, why do I have anxiety? So remember that PD has motor symptoms, tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, which means slowness of movement and trouble with gait and balance. Those are the things that get better with levodopa, with dopamine, but it has a whole host of non-motor symptoms. So things like you know, paresthesias, uh, bladder issues, blood pressure issues like orthostatic hypotension or low blood pressure, mood issues like anxiety and depression, and cognitive issues, so tr trouble with word finding difficulty, short term memory loss, that sort of thing. And those symptoms are made worse by your PD medicines. Your levodopa makes those things work. They make you more constipated. They lower your blood pressure. They can make you more confused. They can make you hallucinate. So when your dopamine levels are low, not only does the tremor come back, but you can have anxiety. So it's important to when patients come into the office that we're treating the right thing, that we're just not giving you a bunch of Xanax and Klonopin and saying, oh, you're just an anxious person, when it's actually due to low levels of dopamine. So if you're off period, your anxiety only comes with the off periods, then our goal is to increase your dopamine level throughout the day, make it last longer. If you don't have off periods, you're not gonna have the anxiety that requires the Xanax. What you need is more levodopa. So it's just part of the non-motor symptoms that come with the Parkinson's disease. The other thing that happens in Parkinson's disease is that you know when your dopamine levels are low, it makes norepinephrine and serotonin low as well. Your levodopa only replaces dopamine. Many times we'll have to use an antidepressant or an SSRI to increase norepinephrine and serotonin to where they should be so that you feel more emotionally resilient like you did before. So if, nor, you know, if norepinephrine and serotonin are too low, you have more anxiety, things seem overwhelming, you can't deal with stress as much. So many times we have to treat, uh, address the anxiety and depression that comes with the Parkinson's disease. And many times depression is one of the non-motor symptoms that's present before your diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. So if we can make you more resilient and things stressors don't seem so overwhelming, then it's easier to manage the disease. But it's important to realize, you know, what is, is it anxiety from off periods or is it just uh, depression? 
but that's common and many times your first sign of off is not a tremor, is that free-floating anxiety. Mm -hmm. On just, not just on the medications, but how do you know when you need to seek more than just your neurologist? Maybe go to a movement disorder or um, maybe therapy for psychology or physical therapy. How do you know when you need to move forward and not just have a neurologist? So, so what movement disorders neurologists, so all we do, 80% of my practice is Parkinson's disease. That's all we do day in and day out is we treat Parkinson's patients. And then people who have essential tremor, dystonia, Huntington's disease, but the bulk of that, the most common of those movement disorders is Parkinson's disease. So I would say that, you know, just like if you have a heart attack, you want to see a cardiologist, you want to see a specialist. If you have Parkinson's disease or Huntington's, you would want to see a specialist. I would say regardless, whether you're seeing general neurology or movement disorders, every single PD patient has to have physical therapy, OTST. You have to have all of those things on board. So remember, the treatment of Parkinson's disease is not like... I can't just treat your tremor and say, okay, the tremor went away, and then say, okay, your quality of life has improved. It hasn't. So if I've treated your tremor, but you still have anxiety, depression, you don't feel like going outside, you're becoming socially isolated, I haven't improved your quality of life. And with Parkinson's disease, we have gait and balance issues. Remember, there's two reasons why PD patients end up in the hospital. Falls that lead to broken bones and swallowing issues that lead to choking and aspiration pneumonia. So we want to be really proactive and prevent both of those things from happening. And how do we do that? Physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy. So we have to treat the whole person, and it's just not the person. PD is a disease that affects the whole family. So, the, I mean, my mother always says, gosh, don't you just get bored seeing PD day in, day out? You know, it's the same thing over and over again, and it's actually not. It's not the same thing over and over again. Everybody is different. And the thing I like about it, it's more like family practice. You see, keep your patients for 20 years, and you get to know the whole family because you have to treat the whole family, you know, the caregiver's part of this too. And if they're not getting any sleep because you have REM sleep behavior disorder, then, you know, things aren't working well. They need to sleep as well. So, so I would say, regardless of whether you see general neuro or not, it's super important from day one to get started with all of the, the physical therapy, speech, OT, and treat it as a multidisciplinary disease. And that it's ongoing. You know, Medicare only gives you 18 visits. You know, it's something that you need to do all of the time. We have a question on that side of the room. First of all, I'm very impressed with your vocabulary. <laughs> If you'd give me a test on all that stuff, I'm not sure I could pass it. Uh -huh. Anyway, my major problem is in my legs. My muscles in my legs burn like crazy, and I'm taking physical therapy uh, four times a week, but it's not helping, and I want to know is what's, what causes this burning in my thighs and in my calves. So the, the question is, you know, what causes, you know, is this thing related to Parkinson's disease or not? Are they, one way to figure out if neuropathy or burning in the feet is related or, bone or pain is related to Parkinson's disease, if your symptoms wax and wane with your medication, so as you're on and off, that's Parkinson's disease. So you can have burning, you know, things that s sound and feel very much like a neuropathy when you're off, but they get better as levodopa goes up. So if the neuropathy or the burning pain is there all of the time, then we know it's not Parkinson's disease, then we have to do a workup uh, for neuropathy and find out, you know, what is your A1C, do you have diabetes, are there any other reasons why you would have burning in the feet? But if the pain... So your, your neurologist can do that workup for you. Mm -hmm. And then if pain, pain is very common. So one, one way that we figure out is your pain due to Parkinson's or uh, TMB, too many birthdays, is it, does, your, it, does it get better with the medication? If, if you, the medicine goes on and the pain goes away, that means that dystonia has melted away, then it's Parkinson's disease. If it's there regardless, you always have that shoulder pain or that back pain, then it's arthritis uh, from too many birthdays. It's better than the alternative. Hello. 
sorry, I have a question from online. Should you exercise every day? Yeah, so excellent question. Should you exercise every day? And the answer is a resounding yes. So the medicines, the therapies that we currently have for Parkinson's disease are purely symptomatic. They just treat the symptoms of the disease. They make the tremor better, the slowness better. They don't stop or slow down the progression of the disease. But now we think that aerobic exercise, the exercise that gets your heart rate up, that makes those cells make new connections. The more connected those cells are, the stronger, more robust they are, the longer they live, the slower the progression of the disease. Remember you said, by the time you see the neurologist, 60% of those cells have already died off. We want to keep that 40% of cells living as long as we can. Physical exercise is one way to do that. It gives off this thing called BDNF. It's like this brain juice that makes your cells live better, longer, and happier. Just like you want to have a well-balanced ba uh, diet, you want to have a well-balanced exercise so that you have aerobic exercise for the brain, and then you have resistance training for the, the muscles and the bones. So remember, in Parkinson's disease, Nothing's going on, you know, nothing's wrong with the muscle. The muscle is, is starting to atrophy because we're not using it, because we have bradykinesia, slowness of movement. So if you're not moving your arm, then the shoulder gets frozen, you know, your biceps starts to lose mass. And so that we want to do some resistance training to keep that muscle nice and strong, keep these quadriceps nice and strong, so that when you do physical therapy, you can get in and out of the chair, in and out of bed, in and out of the car. Uh, and the same thing, when your muscles push and pull on the bone, that's what tells the bone, hey, I need to get stronger. And suck the calcium in from your diet or your supplement and deposit it in the bone. If you don't have that pushing and pulling from the muscle, the bone says, hey, this calcium is very expensive. I'll let it leach out and I, I don't need to do all this extra work. So that's why when you see, go, you know, see the astronauts in the space station, they're on the little treadmill, they're on their stationary bike, because they have to do some resistance training, they're in zero G, they're starting to lose that bone mass, they're getting osteoporosis because they don't have that pushing and pulling. The same thing happens in PD. If you're bradykinetic, you're not moving, you're sitting in the chair, then you're starting to lose bone mass so that if you fall, you're more likely to break a bone. And then just popping that calcium pill sitting on the couch isn't going to do anything. You're just going to have very expensive urine. So for that calcium to work, you need to exercise to make it work. So remember, what I tell patients is that exercise is going to do more for you than any pill we can give you. So the more you walk, the more you'll be able to walk. The same thing with the voice. The more that you use the voice, the more voice you're going to have. A question in the middle? Hi, thank you for coming. Sure, thanks for having me. I'd like your thoughts about the use of CBD as a means of controlling tremors. We've discussed this with our neurologist, and the response from him was rather shocking. He said, a shot of vodka would do the same thing to calm your tremors, and studies long-term show that the use of CBD would uh, cause uh, Alzheimer's to be uh, more, I guess, active, or it would lead to Alzheimer's. And I was wondering if you had heard about that, or should we uh, get a new neurologist? <laughs> so it only took, what, 20 minutes for the CBD oil uh, question to come up? So <laughs> So remember how we said that Parkinson's disease is the poster child for the mind-body connection? Everything that you're thinking, feeling gets reflected in the Parkinson's disease. So there isn't any data on the use of medical marijuana, whether it has CBD or just the THC portion, and its use in Parkinson's disease. But we know it's a sedative, so it's like alcohol, like vodka, or like Xanax. So if we take a sedative, then that's going to make our anxiety less, and therefore make the tremor less, or the dyskinesia less. So CBD doesn't treat PD the way levodopa does, where it turns into dopamine and replaces dopamine, and therefore you have less tremor because you have uh, more dopamine in the system. It treats tremor because it treats anxiety. So there's two par parts of medical marijuana. So there's the CBD oil, which is the 
legal part of it because it doesn't cause you to get high or have hallucinations. And then the THC portion that causes you to have hallucinations or get high. In Parkinson's patients, you are already on psychoactive drugs. You're on Mirapax, which is essentially like taking LSD. So if you want to add in more, uh, you, you know, that can cause more hallucinations. So always, we always want to make sure that the benefits of the medicine or the therapy outweigh the side effects of the medicine. And many patients taking the THC portion causes more hallucinations, more paranoid behavior, more cognitive changes. Some patients uh, find that the CBD oil helps them with sleep, with pain. Um, so what I tell, you know, in Arizona, we don't have recreational use for marijuana, we have medical marijuana, and the card costs $250. So when it first came out, I would say 80% of the clinic went and got a card and started their uh, medical marijuana, and about only 10% of the clinic has renewed the card because clonopin is a lot less expensive and does pretty much the same thing. So what I tell patients, if you use it, if you find it helpful, I have some patients where the pain is a lot better and they sleep better, they like it, uh, keep it. If it didn't work out for you, we'll stop it, try something else. But it works on the mind-body connection, not on the Parkinson's. There's really no data right now. There's very little data for the use of CBD oil, except for in a very rare form of childhood seizure disorder called lennox gasto Otherwise, it's kind of the Wild West, and so we're sort of figuring it out as we go. But we just want to be careful using another psychoactive agent in patients who are on already uh, on dopamine agonist, leave it up, especially if you already have hallucinations or paranoid uh, thoughts. We have a question that was submitted online and then another question on this side of the room. What drugs interact negatively with the Parkinson's medications or which medications should people with Parkinson's avoid? So that's a good question. So remember what happens in Parkinson's disease is that you have low levels of dopamine. You're missing dopamine. So the last thing that we want to do is give you another drug or a drug that blocks dopamine. The drugs that you're most likely to see that block dopamine are the nausea medicines. So things like Compazine or Reglan or Phenergan. Those, they help your nausea and vomiting, but they do that by blocking dopamine. And they're given liberally in the ER, uh, so that we want to block, we want to start, say, hey, I'm allergic to those. And if you need something for nausea or vomiting, you can use Tigan or Zofran, so treat the nausea without having a dopamine blocking agent. The other medicines are antipsychotics that many times uh, you're not going to come across unless you're delirious in the ICU and they might give you Haldol and that's when the movement disorders neurologist screams and says, hey, don't do that. Um, so we have our patients, you know, there to have a, a list of drugs not to take and then a list of drugs that are okay over the counter, especially if you're on MAOB inhibitors like rosagiline or Aslect or Zodago, then there's some cough medicines that we want to avoid, and we have a list of that that we give our patients. Um, so usually it's dopamine blocking agents that are big no-nos that you just say the, those are your new allergies. Uh, and then if you're an MAOB inhibitor, then there's a list of medicines that we want to avoid, and those are sort of like cold and flu medicines. Here's a question. Uh, I actually have, oh, I actually have two questions. One is, uh, seems like the feedback is, is the only problem. If you have a steady uh, infusion of dopamine and also increasing the infusion in case you exercise, then the problems would be solved. Now, there's something called artificial pancreas, and I was wondering if there's any research in an artificial, uh, I wonder what you'd call it, substantia nigra? Is, is there any and then the second question is, uh, the gentleman over there talked about problems in the leg. And my sister has problems on the right side of her arm. So why is there a difference if the problem is just dopamine? Why is there a difference between only the problem in his legs and only the problem in my sister's right, right arm? The, the, uh, the left one goes, does fine. So, so in Parkinson's, so the question is like, you know, why does one side have more symptoms than the other? Why is everybody else different? And then do we have a, do we have an artificial pancreas for PD? So Parkinson's disease starts on one side, 
and then it progresses on to the other side. So many patients, you know, they, they get, the diagnosis is confused with essential tremor. Essential tremor is a familial tremor that runs in families that's bilateral. Both sides, both hands have a tremor, and it's an action tremor. Whereas Parkinson's disease, the symptoms are unilateral. They start on one side and get worse. We don't know why that is, why one side is affected more than the other, but one side starts to lose more dopamine than the other, and so you see the sides, there's more rigidity on one side, bradykinesia, tremor on that side, and that side will always be more affected as the disease progresses. You'll always have more toe cramping, legs, uh, cramping on that side than you do on the other side. Eventually, it goes to the other side and then involves the trunk. And then the questions, you know, do we have something that's like an artificial pancreas? So the closest thing to give you continuous dopamine tone right now is a therapy called Duopa. So remember how we're talking about the pump? So Duopa is a pump that uses a gel form of levodopa, and, to, and it pumps it straight into the small intestine. So it's always getting to where it needs to be, it's bypassing the, the tummy, so if you're constipated and your gastrocolic reflex isn't working, it doesn't matter. If you ate a large protein meal, it doesn't matter, because the therapy is being delivered straight into the small intestine, and it's continuous. It doesn't, it doesn't peak and trough, peak and trough, every time you take a dose of medication. It also gives you an extra dose a little bolus, if you did physical therapy and you need a little extra dose, it has a button to give you an extra dose. But it's been available for four to five years in the US, and when we offer it to patients in the clinic, we can say, look, you know, you're taking Cinnamon or Ritari six times a day, it's hard to keep track of your medicines, to take them on time, your life revolves around your medicine, so you when you take the pill, you no, never know one, when it's going to kick in, and two, how long it's going to last. And that when you do take it, you have on time with dyskinesia. So then we say, well, we can do DBS or deep brain stimulation, where we drill two holes in your head, put some hardware in there, and get you and allow you to take the medicine without the side effects of dyskinesia. Or we can put a medication port into the tummy and attach it to a pump, which is reversible. If for some reason you decided, I don't want this therapy anymore, after six weeks we can pull the tube and go back to pills. Nine times out of 10, patients say, I don't want Duopa, I want DBS, because they don't want the, the tube. But, but I, I mean, I don't know, I don't, I don't understand why you wouldn't want continuous dopamine tone and to have more, more predictability and independence over your therapy. So, because with the, the pills, when you take it, you never know, is it gonna kick in in 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or is it gonna be an hour? And then, how long is this pill gonna last? Am I able to go to church and then brunch, or just church? Whereas with Duopa, you turn the pump on, and it's on until you turn it off. So maybe you guys can tell me what it is about the tube that you're like, oh, I don't want that. I mean, it's amazing how it's very difficult to convince people to take it to, to uh, accept the therapy. They'd rather be on Ritari six times a day. Let's go ahead, yeah. I would like to go back to the wearing off. Uh -huh. Specifically in, uh, at night when I'm sleeping, I sleep eight hours a night and I sleep well, but if the Ritari only lasts for six hours or the Cinemet three hours, um, do I need to take another pill in the middle of the night to um, avoid the symptoms that I'm getting, which are mainly rigidity? So the, the question is about sleep at night. And so sleep in Parkinson's disease is affected for several reasons. So you can have sleep fragmentation. So as your levels of dopamine are wearing off, then your symptoms of PD come back, the motor symptoms, so rigidity, stiffness, bradykinesia, it's harder to turn in bed, the rigidity can lead to dystonia, which means an abnormal contraction of a muscle, and that can be painful and wake you up. Once you wake up, you go to the bathroom, but then your body can't relax enough to fall asleep. So we have to give you a dose of levodopa to relax the body, get, melt away that rigidity, that dystonia. And so we do that several ways. So we'll switch your dopamine agonist to a once a day, so a Mirapex ER or a Nupro patch. 
We'll add a once-a-day MAOB inhibitor like rosagiline or Zodago, and then we'll, add, we'll use longer-acting forms of your medicine like Ritari. But if you're still waking up in the middle of the night with rigidity cramping, then we'll dose you with a dose of levodopa in the middle of the night because it just hasn't lasted as, as long. So patients with DBS and duopa, their sleep is improved because those non-motor symptoms have been improved by that continuous dopamine tone. So it's to keep you on as much as, as long as possible. And it's hard to do because during the day you can pop pills and take your levodopa. At night you're asleep and so you're wearing off. So we use longer acting forms of the medicine and we dose in the middle of the night if we need to. We have a question from online. Can you talk about neurogenic orthostatic hypotension with Parkinson's? Yeah, so the question is about orthostatic hypotension. Remember, it's one of the non-motor symptoms of PD, which is made worse by the medication. So orthostatic hypotension means low blood pressure. So usually you guys are all sitting right here, and then when you stand up, that blood pressure should go up so it perfuses the brain. If the blood pressure doesn't go up enough, instead of going up, it goes down, and that's usually what happens in PD, especially the higher the doses of medicine you're on. So all of your PD medicines, they lower the blood pressure. So when you stand up, if your body says, hey, I'm not getting enough oxygen, your body gets dizzy and says, hey, I'm gonna faint and let gravity put blood into the brain. So orthostatic hypotension is something that's treatable and a cause of falls for Parkinson's disease. So if the patient's orthostatic, then we look at their med list, and then let's say you've had hypertension for 40 years, you've been on lisinopril and some beta blocker, eventually the PD and your PD medicines will start to treat that high blood pressure and we'll start to get rid of those medicines. Then we'll look at your bladder medicines. So your bladder medicines like Vesicare and Flomax, they also lower the blood pressure. So again, remember how we want to say, we want to make sure that the benefits of the medicine outweigh the side effects of the medicine. So if you're taking a bladder medicine and it really hasn't changed the bladder symptoms and all we're getting are the side effects, which is low blood pressure and confusion, then we chuck it and uh, treat it some other way. So we look at that. Then if we eliminated all your other drugs that lower blood pressure, then we tell you to increase your fluids and salt your food. So it's the only time the doctor says to salt your food is to try to keep that blood pressure up. Then if salting the food doesn't work, then there's three different drugs that we can use to artificially keep your blood pressure up. So we can add some Flornef, but if you have glaucoma, then we don't wanna use Flornef. It increases the, blood, uh, the pressure in the eye. We can use Midodrine, or we can use a drug called Northera. So orthostatic hypotension is extremely common in Parkinson's disease. It's something that in our clinic we always check when you come in, and it's a reason for fall. So we want to be aggressive in treating that uh, so that you're not fainting every time you stand up, and that's the reason for your fall. So that's what that is. Every time you increase your dose of Cinemed or Parkinson's medicines, it causes more lower blood pressure, and then we have to tweak that uh, and, and uh, make sure that we keep your blood pressure up. We have a question in the middle section. Hi. Um, you were talking about this resistance to tubes. Yes. It uh -huh. seems like a feeding tube. It kind it's of it's like a feeding tube, but smaller. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I nursed for about 30 years, and I remember I had a lot of elderly patients that had strokes and were never going to get you know up again. And when it came time to put a feeding tube in, um, the families were very resistant. It just challenges people into thinking it's end of life. Right. Uh -huh. Which is not the case here. Right. But I think the mentality is there about that. End of life if you need a feeding tube. Yeah. So I think we have to change that because it's completely the opposite. So if we put the pump in... Uh, then it's not end of life. So it's literally you could go from somebody who's not getting out of a chair, who's, who's socially isolated because they're always off, to somebody who's now on most of the day, or as long as the pump is on, and so that you've now regained independence over your life and predictability over, over your therapy. So I think is that we have to change the story of what is 
being delivered here. I don't think, I think, well, I think it's probably like DBS. So, you know, 20 years ago when DBS was first introduced, nobody said, great, yeah, drill two holes in my head, sign me up for that. And we always did it at the end stage, you know, it didn't work that well because there weren't that many cells there to, to, to um, stimulate. But as DBS became more common and more and more people saw patients with DBS in their support groups, it became better accepted. We started doing it earlier and now it's no big deal. DBS, you know, you talk about DBS with a patient, they're like, sure, fine, I'll, I'll do that. I think as Duoba becomes more common and it's more commonly seen in support groups and you can see the before and after, They'll say like, wow, why wouldn't I do the less invasive therapy of the tube than DBS? Right now, most people get DBS first and then get Duopa. Eventually, that will be switched over. You'll get Duopa first and then DBS. And then right now, they're working they're on a phase three clinical trial. Instead of a tube, it'll be sub-Q like the insulin pump. And I think that will be much easier accepted for the patients. Instead of having the tube, it's just the sub-Q uh, so I think we'll see much more uptick. Eventually, our, I mean, our therapy, I mean, we're not going to have people taking levodopa five times a day. You, you would just go on the pump. We have a question from online. Will you please tell us more about focused ultrasound as a treatment for tremors? So focus, so remember how we talked about DBS or deep brain stimulation? So DBS is a surgery where you put a lead into the brain to, to stop the tremor, give you on time without dyskinesia, and, and make your medicines last longer. So focus ultrasound is a therapy like DBS for patients who are not surgical candidates. So let's say you have a tremor, whether it's Parkinson's tremor or essential tremor. So this would be a non-invasive, non-surgical therapy to treat the tremor where we use focus ultrasound and it goes through the skull and it makes a little lesion, just like we would make the old lesion back in the day, a little pallidotomy. Instead of going through the skull, it's made through focus ultrasound. So the pluses are that it's for patients who are not surgical candidates, so you can't have anesthesia, your heart and lungs can't tolerate a surgery, then we can offer you the uh, focus ultrasound. The minuses are it's only one side. So DBS, we can treat your symptoms on both sides, your tremor on both sides. With focus ultrasound, we can only do one side, usually the dominant side for tremor, especially for essential tremor patients, because they develop trouble with the voice. So it's a non-surgical option uh, for patients who have a tremor that we, can't, we can treat, uh, but we can't do both sides. The other thing is that it's static. Once we do the therapy, that's it. We can't change it in any way. Whereas DBS, we can program it, and as the disease progresses or the tremor becomes larger amplitude, we can program your DBS to keep up with the, the tremor. The other thing that we can do with DBS is that we can take the hardware out and put new hardware in so we can upgrade the system, whereas with focus ultrasound, it's one shot, one deal. That's it. So um, it's a good non-surgical option. The other thing is that it's not available everywhere. So in Arizona, there's nobody that has the equipment uh, to do focus ultrasound. Yes, ma'am. I've got actually two questions. One, you keep talking about um, losing your dopamine in your brain. Mm -hmm. You lose 60% or so, and then you start having symptoms of P P D Parkinson's. Can you ever lose 100% of your dopamine? And what happens if that happens? So in Parkinson's disease, there are cells deep in the brain in something called the substantia nigra, and those cells produce dopamine, and that's what's involved in Parkinson's disease. So for you to develop the motor symptoms of PD, tremor, rigidity, bradykinesia, slowness of movement, and trouble with gait and balance, 60% of that cell loss has already happened. But you've already had non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's, so constipation, restless legs, anosmia, you've lost a sense of smell, you have RBD or REM sleep behavior disorder. So you know, as you continue to lose it more and more of those cells, then more and more of that, uh, that dopamine comes from the medication. So many patients say, oh, I don't want to start levodopa. I read on the internet that after a while it doesn't work anymore, it doesn't work as well. 
The reason that initially you start taking cinnamon at one tablet three times a day, and then 10 years later you take it six times a day, is not because you've become tolerant or habituated to the medication, is that you've lost more dopamine producing cells, and we have to replace more of that dopamine with the medication. So eventually, when you get to very zero of your own dopamine, that's when patients notice, wow, my life is revolving around these pills. The minute the pills metabolize, boom, I'm off. And then it takes longer for that next dose to kick in. And it's the reason why your doctor is picking more expensive, longer-acting medicines to keep you on, because every time you trough, then you're off. Okay, so I can lose all the dopamine that I make, and I'm still going to be here. You're still going to be here. Okay, exactly. Good. Glad you know you're that. still going to be here, only that you'll notice that you're... you're Dopamine all comes from the pill. So without the pill, you're not on. Okay. If you miss the pill or you're 20 minutes late with the pill, then you notice your symptoms come back because that dopamine is all coming from the medication. Okay, another question for you. Mm -hmm. You've given us a lot of medical terminology, a lot of different pills and medicines we can take. What is new coming down the road that may replace a lot of that stuff? Anything? So new medicines... New what, what is that? New treatments? So new treatments, so like we said, so there'll be a newer version of the Duopa pump, which hopefully will be better accepted by the population. So instead of having the port, it'll be a sub-Q pump. Uh, and so I think if that works better, we don't have the granulomas, then more patients will be on the pump sooner uh, rather than later. And that there's newer forms of levodopa. So like now we have Embresia, that's a rescue medicine that goes through the lungs to kick in faster. So remember, everything that's happening right now, if you're taking it a pill, it goes through the gut and we're at the mercy of the gut. So if the pill gets stuck in the tummy and it doesn't advance anywhere, then we're off. So we have other ways to treating those off periods. So we can do a rescue medicine with an inhaler and go through the lungs, kick in faster. Only that medicine only lasts about 60 minutes. And then there'll be newer drugs that are not based on dopamine, a different kind of chemical, and those may work better, especially for non-motor symptoms. Then there's new hardware coming out for all. Now there's three different companies that make DBS hardware, uh, so that's advancing very quickly. So we'll have different technology for the deep brain stimulator, uh, which will make it more interactive uh, sensing technology. So there's lots of new stuff going on. We have a question from online. Uh, Paula would like more information on Parkinson plus syndrome. Why is it more difficult to treat it than Parkinson's? So there's so the question is about Parkinson plus and Parkinson's disease. So there's Parkinson's disease, and then there's what we call Parkinson plus syndromes, the cousins of Parkinson's disease. Initially, they all look the same. Everybody looks the same, stiff, rigid, bradykinetic. The difference is if you give them levodopa and they get better, then we call that idiopathic Parkinson's disease. If you give the patient levodopa and they don't get better, then we know it's one of the Parkinson plus syndromes. And then as the disease progresses in the next five years, then you'll know which one it is. So if they can't look up or down, they have eye difficulty, then we call that PSP. If they develop an alien hand syndrome, then we call that CBGD. So it's different if they developed dementia in the first year, then we call that Lewy body dementia. So Patients who respond to levodopa or dopamine, we call that Parkinson's disease. If you don't have a response to levodopa, then we call that a Parkinson plus syndrome. And then our therapy is much more supportive, things like physical therapy, occupational therapy, because the drugs that we have for PD don't work in those patients. They question. can't absorb the dopamine. Question up front. Hi, I've had Parkinson's for 25 years. And uh, I take resagiline because I'm allergic to carbidopa, levodopa. My biggest complaint right now is I tend to close one eye. Do you have an answer for that? So the question is about eyelid apraxia. So many times you can have trouble with the, the eyes in Parkinson's disease and sometimes with the eyelids. So if your eyelids close and you can't open them, you have to use your finger to open the eye, then we call that eyelid apraxia. So think of it as a form of freezing of gait, but only for the eyelids. And we can 
treat that with some Botox. So some patients find that Botox is helpful for eyelid apraxia. So we use that, but it's something that is, happens in Parkinson's disease and it can be difficult to treat. So it's eyelid apraxia. So in Parkinson's disease, the eyes are affected in several ways. Remember, Parkinson's affects all of the muscles of the body, body including the muscles that manage the eyes. So that if your eyes don't move together as quickly as they should, then you perceive that as blurriness. That they, they control the muscles that control the lens in the eye. So that controls accommodation. So if you're looking far away and then you're going to read the menu, it takes you longer to accommodate. So that looks like blurriness. And then eventually it should clear up. And then your night vision and contrast vision is not as good as it should be uh, with Parkinson's disease. So um, there's many ways that are... The other thing that happens in Parkinson's disease is that you don't blink as often as you used to, so the eyes dry out and they get itchy. So we can use artificial tears to keep the eyes lubricated. But eyelid apraxia is when you can't close the eyes and you can't open them anymore, and we can use Botox to treat eyelid apraxia. We have a question back here. Thank you. How promising do you find the new res some newer research I've looked at that connects what is happening in your gut and the bacteria there with what's going on in your head? Yeah, so that's super interesting. So that gut-brain axis and then the microbiome. So today, our most... Today we're starting to think that Parkinson's actually doesn't start in the brain, it starts in the gut. And then from there, it goes up into the brain. So that gut is those premotor symptoms of PD. So remember, you've got a little brain here in the gut and a big brain here in the gut. And so that's why people say, I have a gut feeling. It's your little brain thinking there. And so <laughs> also gut microbiome. Uh-huh. Yep, so that's super exciting, all brand new research. So it turns out... Will you repeat that, the question? Yeah, oh, so the, the question's about the gut microbiome, and I'll explain a little bit. So it turns out that we're mostly bacteria. It's 10 to 1, 10 bacteria cells to 1 human cell. So if some alien came down, looked at a little tricorder and said, what is this? They would say, this is a bag of water and a tons of... Uh, bacteria. So the bacteria, we used to think it's all bad. It only does bad things. It turns out bacteria does a lot of good things. You know, it makes vitamins for us like vitamin K. It makes uh, chemicals, neurochemicals for us like serotonin that helps with mood and anxiety. So it turns out that patients with Parkinson's disease have a different gut microbiome than patients who don't have Parkinson's disease. So that means that their gut flora is different. And it turns out that it's different whether you have tremor-predominant PD versus rigid-predominant PD. Those patients have different gut flora. And so there's uh, research being done in California. Somebody took a mouse that has a large tube mutation. So remember, at Parkinson's disease, we don't know exactly what causes it, but we think there's some genetic mutation that's turned on by some environmental toxin that gives you the disease. So what they did is they took these mice that have a LARC2 mutation, something that makes you susceptible to Parkinson's disease, and they wiped out their flora, and then they introduced the flora of a PD patient. Those, par those mice develop Parkinsonism, that a tremor, trouble with gait and balance, then they wiped out their flora with antibiotics and they got better. So all it hasn't been done in humans because we don't know exactly which is the gut flora. But I think 10, 15 years from now, part of our therapy for Parkinson's disease is something like a fecal transplant, something like we use for C. diff. So C. diff, you know, if we treat it with flagell antibiotics, only 70% of those patients get better when they have a, an infection of C. diff. But if we treat those patients with a fecal transplant of somebody with a normal flora, 90% of those patients get better. So the question is, why can't you do that with PD patients now? Because we don't know what the, gut, what the good gut flora is. So all we know right now is that patients with Parkinson's disease have a less diverse flora than, patient, than normal patients. They don't have a diverse flora. So we don't know which gut flora to introduce. And the other thing is that, so remember, PD patients, they're all constipated. <laughs> 
Uh, and so, and what happens when you're constipated? Uh, you, you know, what, why, what, we want to treat the constipation more fiber. The more fiber we have, the less constipation we have. If we feed your gut more fiber, that's going to feed the good bacteria. The bacteria like to eat fiber. If there's not enough fiber in your diet, then the bacteria eat the small chain fatty acids in the mucosal lining of the small intestine. So if they're eating your small intestine instead of the fiber, then what happens to the gut? It gets more leaky. So that if you take in a toxin in the well water or the herbicide or pesticide, it's more likely to get in through into the blood system, the uh, circulatory system. And so then what happens in Parkinson's disease is that there's a protein called alpha-synuclein that gets misfolded. Somehow, we don't know that connection yet, but once we misfold that protein, which is in the gut, in the little brain, in the little brain in the gut, once that back that a protein gets misfolded, then it makes the other proteins misfold as well. So, you know, somebody had a asked a question about stem cells uh, outside. And so, once we have that misfolded protein, it acts like a prion, like an infectious agent. And it goes from one cell to the other cell, making those other proteins misfold as well. So, Many patients ask, well, what about stem cell? Can I just replace the cells in my substantia nigra and be good to go? And it turns out that those cells also get Parkinson's disease. They also get Lewy bodies because alpha-synuclein is a prion-like agent that goes from one cell to the other. So that what we have to do is that we have to stop the progression of the misfolded alpha-synuclein so that the new cells don't get Parkinson's disease. So in the future, the the cure of PD is not going to be replacing dopamine-producing cells. It's going to be stopping the, the transmission of this misfolded protein in the gut. So that if we can stop it going up the vagus nerve into the brain, then you never develop the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And therefore, it just remains a disease where you're constipated and talk at night and can't smell anything. <laughs> so <laughs> So, but you know, today we can we can we can diagnose Parkinson's disease before you get to the neurologist office. So just like you with a DAT scan. So just like you get a mammogram or a colonoscopy when you're 50 years old, patients who are at risk for PD, you have constipation, depression, RLS, RBD, first degree relative with Parkinson's disease, those patients would get a DAT scan. And then when we get Agent X, something that's neuroprotective, that's going to stop PD in the gut, then we would give those patients that new therapy, whatever it turns out to be. Uh, and probably it'll be some part, part of that will be some kind of fecal transplant. Uh, and that we would stop the progression of PD from becoming a neurologic disorder. We have a question on that side of the room. Question from online and then question you want to get the microphone? Or this goes along with what you were talking about. You mentioned leaky gut. This person says, I've been told I have leaky gut. Is this connected with my PD? So, so what I mean by leaky gut is that the, the lining that protects your gut, that protects you from the outside, remember the gut is exposed to your outside environment so that we want to prevent toxins from getting in. And so you have this layer of mucosa, that sort of think of it as a film that protects the gut. But if the bacteria doesn't have enough fiber to eat in your diet, then it's going to eat the, the lining in the gut, the small chain fatty acids there. And then that's going to make it more leaky in the sense that it's more exposed to, less protected to the environmental toxins uh, in the environment so that you're more, whatever that agent is that now starts the misfolded protein is more likely to get through. So what should we do? We should have lots of fiber in our diet so that we're feeding the good bacteria and that good bacteria crowds out the bad bacteria. Many patients say, well, can I just take probiotics? And so probiotics, you take them and then you poop them out in 24 hours. What we want to do is that we want to seed, we want to fertilize the soil so that when good bacteria gets there, it's more likely to take hold and, and grow and, and do its thing. So that we want to have prebiotics 
more fiber in the diet. So if you look at your plate and you look down at your plate, there's lots of colors, bright colors, different kinds of colors, then you have a well-balanced diet, a diet that's give you lots of antioxidants, nutrients, vitamins. If you look down and it's all one color and it's kind of brown, it came out of a box, then <laughs> that's not going to feed the good bacteria. Yes, uh, doesn't have to do with meds, but our question is uh, being sent to a neuropsychologist who did, ran a large battery of tests all day. How much merit do you put on tests? Testing? So the question is about neuropsychology or testing for that. And so many times we'll order neuropsych testing before we get DBS or deep brain stimulation because we know that DBS can make dementia worse. So we don't want to send somebody who's on their way to dementia and poke two holes in their head. Uh, so we do de neuropsych testing on all of those patients. We know that cognitive issues are part of Parkinson's disease. Just like you can have bradykinesia, which means slowness of movement, you can have bradyphrenia, which means slowness of thinking. And then about 40% of PD patients will develop a dementia that looks very similar to Alzheimer's disease. If you develop dementia the, in the first year of diagnosis, then we call that Lewy body dementia. If you develop dementia 15, 20 years later, then we call that Parkinson's disease with dementia. And what the neuropsych testing allows us to see is, are you having more trouble with word finding difficulty, visual spatial problems, cognitive problems? Uh, and so it sort of tells you where you are. And usually we get that before DBS testing or DBS surgery. We have a couple questions online. Nancy asked, my husband had a DAT scan in 2012 that was positive for Parkinson's. Since it's been seven years and it was a new test, should he have another DAT scan to confirm he does have it or still has it? He does not have any tremors, never has had tremors. So the DAT scan, so right now the DAT scan doesn't have a percentage, so it's either positive or not positive. So if it's positive, there's no need to repeat it. And what the DAT scan looks like, so the DAT scan is like a CAT scan or an MRI. It's a picture of the brain. But unlike a CAT scan or MRI, it doesn't look at the structures of the brain. It looks at dopamine-producing cells in the brain. So if you've lost dopamine-producing cells, then the, it doesn't light up. So instead of having two commas, you have two periods. And it tells us that we've lost dopamine-producing cells. It doesn't tell us what percentage, so there's no need to repeat it. If you don't have a tremor, then it's the Parkinson's patient that's rigid predominant. So not every PD patient has a tremor. Uh, you can have Parkinson's disease without the classic resting tremor. And in fact, especially in young onset patients, that delays their diagnosis because nobody thinks that a 40-year-old could have PD, so they're diagnosed with frozen shoulder or knee problems, uh, that sort of thing. And then a DAT scan is very helpful for us in cases where you've been on dopamine blocking agents. So the psychiatrist has put you on Risperidol or Haldol. And the question is, did we uncover an early PD by um, adding these agents? Or is this all a drug-induced Parkinsonism? So a DAT scan is normal in a patient who has drug-induced Parkinsonism, where we've just blocked dopamine and make them look Parkinsonian. And it's positive in somebody where we've uncovered an early PD or they have idiopathic Parkinson's disease. So many times, if the psychiatrist start you on Haldol or Seroquel and you're 50 years old, we can unmask or uncover early PD in your 50s when otherwise, if you had never been put on these agents, you wouldn't have shown up to the neurologist office for you know, 15 more years or 10 more years. Let's ask another question from online. <laughs> Is there anything to help with coughing, choking on their own saliva, not during drinking or eating? Yeah, so dysphagia or trouble swallowing uh, is very common. Remember that Parkinson's affects all of the muscles of the body. So just like you don't 
blink as often, the eyes dry out. You don't swallow as often as you used to, so the saliva tends to pull out and then drool out, and you have trouble with swallowing as well. The swallowing mechanism is slower, so that you've got a little flap that closes off the windpipe, uh, so that when you're eating, none of that food goes down the wrong pipe and cause choking. If it's too slow, then that can get stuck there, and you can choke on your food, or you can aspirate on food. So many times we'll send you to the speech therapist, we'll do a swallow study, we'll modify your diet, so that you're less likely to uh, chew on food, uh, to uh, choke on the food, and then give you sort of tips for that. Drooling is also very common. So many times the medicines that you use for Parkinson's disease, they actually dry you out. You actually produce less saliva, but because you're not swallowing as often as you used to, it tends to drool, you know, pool and then drool out. So in those patients, what we usually start with is suck on a hard candy or chew some sugarless gum that automatically gets you to swallow. Uh, and then sometimes we can use some Botox in the submandibular glands to shut down the production of saliva in those glands so that you have less saliva, less stuff to choke on or to drool out. But it's something that we involve the speech therapist and do swallow studies with. All right, we have a question here in the middle. Hello. Hi. I, I'm just checking my speech, make sure I can still talk. Still talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, have a question. Years ago, there you go. Years ago, I had a different life. I was a chemical person, and we had a lot of different chemicals we used, mainly organophosphates, diazinon, dope, uh, that, that type of thing. Now, you really don't get that anymore, but for years we used that. Now, I have protection. All we ever checked for was... Uh, uh, colon esterase inhibitors. So I always went in, I was always clean. But that doesn't mean, I guess, that there are other things involved with that. Though. We, we had chemicals, we used phosphine gas, and we used chlor methyl chloride. Do you have any research at all that shows those things are, are not good or specifically directed to, towards Parkinson's issues? So, no, so just like there's more than one gene that can predispose you to Parkinson's disease, there's more than one toxin. So, Either, we don't know what they all are, uh, and things like now Agent Orange is thought to be causing Parkinson's disease. So probably there's something in that mixture that turned on whatever gene you have that makes you susceptible to PD. We probably will never know what it is, um, but the... Be well, uh, uh, cocktail. cocktail, right. Uh -huh. um, so. So remember, you need two things, the gene and the toxin. Just, and many patients ask, well, if I have the disease, what does that mean for my kids? So just having the gene doesn't mean you're going to get the disease. And just having exposure to the toxin doesn't mean you're going to get the, the disease. You need both of those things together to get the disease. Uh, so that means we just want to keep our air and our water and everything as clean as possible, especially patients who drink well water. I have a question that was submitted to us. Uh -huh. I would like to participate in clinical trials. What are the risks in doing so? I assume it is imperative to get input from my neurologist before taking part in a clinical trial. Yeah, so the question is about clinical trials, and they're extremely important because it's the way we get new medicines. So if nobody enrolls in a clinical trial for Mirapax or Duopa, then we can't get it to market. And what is involved in a clinical trial is that we've got two arms. We've got the therapeutic arm, the one who's going to get the drug, and then the placebo arm, the one who's going to get the sugar pill. And those are randomized so that neither the patient nor the doctor knows where you ended up. So many patients say, well, I don't want to do the trial if I end up in the placebo group. But we have to do that to prove that this is better than placebo. So it's like one of the problems with CBD oil, we don't have any data that says this is better than taking M&Ms. Um, so that we need to prove that this does something and that it's safe for you. So I would absolutely encourage patients uh, to participate in clinical trials. It's a very small percentage of PD patients who actually enroll in trials. It's like the same ones over and over again. If more people enrolled in trials, we would get more uh, drugs to market, I think, a little bit faster. It wouldn't take so long to enroll these trials. So I would discuss it with your neurologist, and I would absolutely encourage you uh, to participate in trials. Uh, and that's the, that's the only way we get new drugs to market. 
There were two questions submitted online about speech, and if Dr. Ospina wouldn't mind if I answer oh, them. Oh, no, of course, okay. please. Real we'll have the expert. So, so somebody, at, yeah, you, you, <laughs> you added information. Somebody asked, at what point in the progression of Parkinson's do you recommend a person be referred for speech therapy? So I would say that every person with Parkinson's, so 90% of people with Parkinson's are likely to develop speech and swallowing difficulties. So it would be wonderful to go ahead and have an evaluation just as a baseline. You may not need speech therapy at that point, but good to have a baseline. But the early symptoms of a speech disorder are a soft voice, raspy or breathy voice, a voice that is inconsistent. Some days it sounds just fine, and other days it doesn't sound so good. Trailing off at the end of sentences, and a lot of people describe that they can't count on their voice. When they're about to say something, they're not sure exactly what's going to come out. And it's very common for people with Parkinson's not to necessarily recognize those symptoms. So to really listen to family and friends who are leaning forward or saying that your voice sounds different. So those are all symptoms. And then somebody asked a question about a device called Speech Vibe. This is a device that is being marketed to people with Parkinson's. It's expensive. It's about $2,500. And just my professional opinion after working with people with Parkinson's for 20 years is that we always want you to have your voice without having to run and go get your device. If there's an emergency, we want you to call for help. We want you to be able to use the phone. And so using a treatment like Speak Out and Loud Crowd, I would much prefer you do that, even though this person said they have had um, Parkinson's for 36 years. It's probably not too late. I would have an evaluation. And if you don't have a Speak Out provider in your area, even if you're in another country, Parkinson Voice Project's next grant cycle will open in January, and we will provide free training and speech therapy supplies to clinics all over the U.S., and we'll open it up abroad who want to bring our program to their area. So we want everybody with Parkinson's to have the treatment that they need. So remember that PD is a progressive disease. With time, it gets worse very slowly, but it does get worse. So you want to get ahead of it, and you want to develop those good habits early on so that the easier you want to do your big and loud and swing your arms and have the loud voice. The earlier you get into those habits and learn those exercises, the better off you're going to be. So in our clinic, everybody right off the bat, day one, PTOT speech, uh, all of that all comes together. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. Um, when you're, what do you, you talk a lot about increasing your dopamine and so on. What do you about, do about dyskinesia? So the remember where we had this. So the the reason you get dyskinesia is that we're going above that therapeutic line. So you have on time with dyskinesia, which means too much dopamine for your system. So then we have several ways to treat that. So let's say you're on two tablets every three hours of Parkinson's, of levodopa. But every time you take a dose of the two tablets, you get dyskinetic, you get on time with dyskinesia. Then we can fractionate the dose so that we can take one and a half tablets so that you don't peak above the line, but we stay within that therapeutic window. But then what happens? Two and a half tablets don't last as long as two tablets, so we have to take them closer together. So again, the reason why your doctor is migrating to these longer acting, more expensive medicines so that we don't have to take medicine so often during the day. So and then we can take medicine specifically for dyskinesia. So those are medicine like amantadine, Gocovri, Osmolex. And then we can do DBS, or deep brain stimulation, to give you on time without dyskinesia. I've had the DBS. Mm -hmm. then, then Duopa. So Duopa is a way to keep you in that therapeutic window without peaking above or trough and below so that you don't have on time with dyskinesia or off time, and it's easier for us to keep you in that therapeutic window. So remember, it's about continuous dopamine tone so that we don't want to peak and trough, peak and trough on and off, on and off throughout the day. That's what causes the disability in Parkinson's disease that you don't have any control over your therapy, your on time. So if we can go on and stay on, then you don't have to think about or worry about your Parkinson's disease. You're just on. 
You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, your, your phone isn't ringing every three hours. So, okay. so, so this is, so we have to use therapies that keep you in that therapeutic window. So that's what your neurologist is always trying to do. So if you've had DBS, Duopa is, is another therapy that, that to look at. Okay, unfortunately we are out of time, but we do have a gift for Dr. Ospina. Uh. Um, one of our loud crowd members is an artist and a photographer, and she was searching all over for a James Parkinson's tulip. We don't know that this is exactly <laughs> it, right. but it looks like it. So this is for you. Oh, thank you very and, uh, much. It's we, beautiful. We will I'll ship put, it to you, oh, so you don't have to take it Have to it worry plane, about it. So. Okay, thank you. I'll put it in my office. Let's give uh -huh. Dr. Espino a round of applause. <laughs> thank you.